morning, everyone. Welcome to this session about uh, upgrading and maintaining uh, uh, updates of uh, JVMs in large scale. Please welcome Volke, who is working at AWS. So hi, good morning. Uh, happy that you could make it to this first session. It's always hard for such a nice party. So nevertheless, let's get it started. My name is Volker Simonis. I'm a principal engineer in the Amazon Coreto team. I'm working on Java, on the JVM, JDK since more than 20 years. Started at SAP in the SAP JVM and Submachine team and now more than four years in the Coreto team. I'm a an Open JDK committer reviewer. I'm a member of various Open JDK groups. I'm representing uh, Amazon in the JCP, Java Community Process Executive Committee. Uh, and mostly I'm hacking on the hotspot. So success and scale bring both broad responsibility. Uh, this sounds like it's from a Spider-Man film, but uh, it's actually one of the Amazon leadership principles. So pro tip, if you ever want to apply for a job at Amazon, you have to learn them all. And we got two new recently, and this is one of the two news. We had 14 before, and this is now the 16th leadership principle. So what does it say? It says we are big, we impact the world, and we are far from perfect. We must be humble and thoughtful about even the secondary effects of our actions. Our local communications, planet, and future generations need to be better every day. So how does this apply to our work, and what has this to do with upgrading from Java 8 to 17? These are great words, right? <laughs> So I hope this gets a little clearer during this talk. So a lot of people ask us, why the hell do you have a JDK team at Amazon? I mean, there is so many JDK distributions out there. Uh, why don't you just use OpenJDK from Red Hat or from Oracle? Well, we have Amazon.com. It's a quite big site. You, a lot of people buy things from us. There is things like Black Friday. We also have Lambda internal services, S3, uh, if something goes wrong at this scale, we really want to fix it quickly. It's security issues, it's crashes, it's performance, it's footprint. We really have to, to take ownership of this. Nobody else will help us in the, the extreme case. And it's not only about fixing things, it's also about uh, optimizing things. At our scale, it's important to run more efficient and use less footprint. And that's not only in order to be cheaper, to, uh, to have more profit. It's also nice for environment, for our carbon footprint, uh, for, for everybody. But it's not just us, it's also you, our users. A lot of our users run Java code on Lambda, Fargate, AKS, our clusters. And we want to make sure that Java runs uh, perfectly, that your Java applications run nice on our platform, but also that Java remains uh, vibrant and active and supported for the future. And that's why we are also part of the OpenJDK community and of the larger Java ecosystems. Uh, Amazon Coreto team is one of the biggest external contributors to the OpenJDK. We develop not only upstream in the head project, we are also very active in maintaining the LTS releases from 8 to 17, 21 now. We are part of the OpenJDK vulnerability group, which makes sure that every quarter all the vulnerabilities, all the reported vulnerabilities get fixed in time. So what is Amazon Coreto? Amazon Coreto is our downstream distribution of OpenJDK. It's no cost, free, long-term supported. We have the quarterly security releases. Usually we release them few hours after the embargo is lifted by Oracle, I would say we are very, very <coughs> fast. We are one of the fastest with releases of security uh, releases. Uh, we started uh, more than five years ago, actually, already uh, to announce uh, Coreto at DevOps 2018 in, in Brussels with three binary artifacts at that time. I think it was Coreto 8 on Linux mostly. Currently, we have like all these versions from 8 to 21. We also have the feature releases. And we have a lot of added a lot of platforms, all the platforms our users requested, from the new Apple M1 to ARM32, Alpine, so on and so forth, Windows, all, all the different uh, platforms, we cover them. And if you want more, just uh, open a, a pull request. 
So one of the things we care a lot for is performance on, on ARM, on the ARM platform. Because you might know that uh, Amazon develops its own custom silicon. That's our Graviton ARM64 chips. Uh, they are available in almost all Amazon services in EC2, in Lambda, Fargate, and so on. And from our experience, they deliver up to 40% price performance uh, uh, improvement over the custom x86 uh, uh, instances, which we also offer, obviously. But it's not only the better price performance, it's even more important is the 60% less, the less energy consumption. And this, again, plays a role not only in the way how we can pack them into our, in our compute centers. We need less space, we need less energy, we have more or less uh, footprint, carbon footprint. And that's good not only for us, but also for our customers. You can decrease your carbon footprint just by moving your workloads from x86 instances, for example, to ARM instances. And we do a lot, we take care that uh, Java is running perfectly on, on these instances. Amazon is quite big. We have a lot of uh, regions, availability zones. This is just a, a diagram. And we are constantly growing. And there, is, there, there are restrictions. Sometimes we have no more place to, to put in more racks into our compute center. Sometimes we have place, but there is not enough electricity available. And then again, <clears throat> every optimizations we do in the JVM, even if it's just a few percent better performance, this directly translates to less place we need, less uh, electricity we need. And these data centers, they have like 10,000, 100,000 of computers. So a few percent is like thousands of computers. It's like millions of dollars a year. Another benefit or another advantage we have is that we have these millions, really hundreds of millions of servers running Java. This means we can find errors which others maybe see once in a lifetime, once a year, once every 10 years. The JBS, the Java bug system, we will take a look at it later, uh, has a lot of, of open bugs which nobody can reproduce. Because as, as if, if you run 10 servers, you might see that every second year or so. We, we might see these errors every week which makes it much easier for us to reproduce them, to pinpoint them, to fix them. I will show you some of the issues we fixed recently, which haven't been, uh, no, uh, haven't been seen before that. So I want to go into details of this slide. It's just the AWS shared responsibility model with respect to security. If you're an AWS customer, AWS customer, you probably know this. It's what every Amazon has to do. Uh, to keep your cloud application secure and what's the responsibility of the customer. But we have defined something we call the application performance shared responsibility model. So the community, like the OpenJDK community, strives for making the JVM and the JDK better. So it's the lower part, right? But it's not only the JVM, the JDK. There's the different languages running on the JVM. There are the different libraries, like log4j, JSON, a, a lot of hundreds, thousands of libraries. That's actually what makes Java such a great platform because we have so much libraries and we have great frameworks like Spring, uh, Micronode, I don't know, Jakarta. There's a lot of stuff and all, all the community is working on improving this every day. We get new versions and every new version has new features, but it's also more efficient and faster. So that's our responsibility, to make the JVM and the, the platform faster, re more reliable, better. Your responsibility as a user is, however, to upgrade to these new versions, because otherwise our work has, makes no sense. So your data structures, program services should, run, sh should always run on the latest version that we supply, so everybody takes advantage of the improvements. So obviously, not everything is perfect. We're not living in a perfect world. So upgrading has benefits, but there is also downsides. So let's start with the good things. I will show you some uh, examples from our internal uh, services and what benefit the upgrade from A to 17 has brought to them. So this is a monitoring service which runs on almost every internal server in Amazon. It monitors CPU usage, disk usage, memory usage, and so on. 
and reports that to, and into a, a central system. So as you can see, uh, in <coughs> July 22nd, we upgraded the service from 8 to 17, and this is a metric of the service itself, and it monitors the heap memory after GC usage. So that, that's a metric which takes, which me measures how much memory in the Java heap is used right after GC. It's basically a metric for the, for the life set of your application. And as you can see, just upgrading from 8 to 17 brought a decrease of about 50% of the, of the memory usage in the heap. That's, that's massive. So for a service like this, this means they can descale the fleet by almost 50%. There's still some hiccup there, not sure what happened there. But like in general, you see, they can save half of their, of their servers. Or other way around, they could keep they could go on smaller instances, which is basically the same thing, because then smaller instances can be packed more densely on the hardware, and the same effect. So you save money, you save, cost, you save costs, and again, you save uh, footprint, COC, CO2 footprint. And by the way, this is, all these slides will have this P100, P95. So P100 is basically the worst case. It's the, all the measurements we have seen as a percentile P95 is like the 95 best measurements you get. So the difference between P95 and P100 is like the 5% worst uh, measurements you see, and that's basically the, the, blue, the blue part, and that goes down significantly. So here's the second monitoring service. Here, uh, this service runs on 10,000s of hosts, 10,000s of servers. And uh, by moving from 8 to 17, we got a 7% fleet utilization improvement. So again, if you run on two servers, 7% doesn't mean actually a lot. <laughs> you cannot go from two servers to one. But if you run on 10,000 of servers, that's millions of savings per year. And another benefit of moving from 8 to 17 for this service, which is not shown in this graph here, is the fact that they could uh, improve their cold start fault reduction by 98%. What does that mean? Because this service is running on so many hosts, constantly some of the hosts fail for whatever reason. So we constantly have to start up new hosts of this service. And there is some time limits in which this new service, in these new instances have to be online. And this service had massive problems with the startup time because it took a long time to start. And if the, the service was not available after a certain time, it was killed and then replaced by another one. So just by migrating from 8 to 17, these faults went reduced by 98%. And finally, the put latency, that's the, the time they used to write their results to, to a storage, was also improved by, by almost 20%. So very nice wins. So here, the third example is a proxy server. Proxy service, we use a lot of proxy services inside Amazon to send data from one service to another to get data from outside, from you, and uh, route it to our internal services. And as you might imagine, proxy services are very latency and sensitive because you have a lot of them, and the latency of every service adds up. So here, by migrating from 8 to 17, we got about 75% lower latency. The latency went down from almost 100 milliseconds to less than 20 milliseconds. And, uh, Again, the team could have descaled their fleet, but because they knew that they were a growing service and they expected much more traffic to come in for the next year, they just did nothing. So they had no direct savings, but instead they could just keep their fleet for the next one or one and a half years and, and handle all the incoming traffic without additional costs. So this is uh, another interesting uh, Example I want to show you, it's an analytics service. Here we upgrade it from 11 to 17. So it's not just 8 to 17. 11 is also more than three years older than 17, right? And there were a lot of improvements which went into, into the JDK in this time. So one of the things you should take from these slides is that uh, when, you, when you look at your normal operation, there is not much improvement. So but actually, the customer complained, or not complained, but they were not so happy after the upgrade because they say, yeah, but you see, it's not a lot what happened. 
but where the, where the new Java versions really shine is in extreme situations, when you get these spikes, so you see the P100 GC time. Or for Java 11, that, that went up to almost seven seconds, whereas for, for 17, it, it stays uh, under a under few uh, hundred milliseconds. The P100 CPU time, the latency, again. This was also interesting because this service run in two availability zones uh, and processed the same data in two different av availability zones. And they migrated one availability zone to uh, 17, which is the blue graph, and the other one stayed on 11. So we had a very nice A-B testing and, uh, <coughs> and this resulted in this graph. So when you are testing, test for, for the peak, for, the, for your peak usage, for the extreme situations, because sometimes you, don't, you might not see improvements for the, for the normal operation, but you should actually prepare for, for these situations. <coughs> and actually Java is very major already, so it makes it very hard to improve the general performance of, of, of every application. But where new Java versions get better and better is like in these extreme situations, like the P100 GC time, the, the memory consumption extreme situations. All this stuff gets a lot of attention recently. So here is uh, the last, my last example is uh, about the service which moved from 11 to 17, but didn't really see a lot, again, a lot of improvements. And this service was using Shenandoah GC, which is a new job garbage collection initially developed by, by Red Hat. Uh, currently, we are maintaining it and extending it uh, with a generational feature. And there were a lot of improvements in uh, Shenandoah GC between 11 and 17, so the customer had quite some expectations when moving from 11 to, 7, from 11 to 17. But uh, we did uh, this test between August 24th and August uh, 26th. So I have to zoom in this graph to show it a little better. So again, we have here the P50, P90, P99, and 99.9% .9 of the GC post times. You see, they went down a little bit. If you zoom in even more, we can see that uh, the P50, that's the blue line here, that goes down to under a millisecond. So it's actually not observable anymore. Even, even uh, P90 and P99 is like around one, two milliseconds. Unfortunately, we still have these spikes here at P99.9, which are almost some, they are much, much fewer, but still almost up to 20 milliseconds. But this is actually not the GC problem anymore. There is a lot of other stuff going on on the machine, in the, in the, in the, on, the, on the VM. So this graph actually shows that the GC is, is not a problem anymore. It's not observable. We, we are still working on eliminating these other uh, spikes here, but they are not related to GC anymore. So for this service, the GC cannot, basically cannot be improved anymore. We have to look for other things which are done at save points or for, for better memory usage, better caching on, on the machine itself. So to summarize, friends, don't let friends run JDK 8 or 11. Please move to 17 or even 21. I will come to 21 in a few minutes. Uh, we think 21 is great. We haven't recommended our customers to use 21 productively until now, but we think like with uh, 2103, which will come up in April, we are basically almost there. So probably with April or in the summer, we will start massive migrating internal customers to 21. So what's, what's the bad? Until now, I only showed you uh, the, the benefits you get from upgrading, right? What is, what is bad about that? So it's not really so many bad things, but as you all know, upgrading takes effort and you run into regressions. The most visible is the closing of the closing the access to internal fields and methods in, in JDK 17. So you just cannot reflectively access this stuff anymore. And here that we had one regression with a JSON library where we had, uh, where the application had a catch-all block. 
So the JSON library failed to serialize some objects, obviously showed an exception, but this exception was catched and it went unknown. So only after, I don't know, days, weeks, the teams realized that some of their serialized data is incomplete. And then they start digging what happened. And they finally found in the logs these, these, uh, these messages. So the nice thing is there is an exception thrown, but the JVM also prints these messages to standard error. So if you take logs, you should not just take them, you should also look into them from time to time. And especially when you do upgrades, like from 8 to 17, you should carefully watch what's in your logs and what's different from your previous logs. And actually, you shouldn't do that only uh, when upgrading from 8 to 17. It's a good idea to do that when you do the quarterly security updates because they come with quite some improvements, but also a lot of new changes. So it's always good to see what happened. And then obviously, this such a kind of error should have been catched by a unit test right in the first place. But as you all know, not everything is covered. So a test was added for this and uh, the, the problem was actually not that hard to fix in the end, but it shows uh, what, what can go wrong. So here's another interesting uh, regression we got when upgrading from A to 17. And this is actually based on, on an improvement which was made in 17. So this, this often happens that optimizations sometimes fire back and, and lead to un, un, uncommon situations or unwanted situations although it's actually an optimization. So in this case, the reference processing in the parallel GC was not parallel. So like parallel GC does the GC on multi-threads, so it's faster than serial GC, but one phase of parallel GC, namely the reference processing, was serial before. So in, in uh, 17, that was fixed and made parallel as well. But then for, for one service here, we see that uh, the CPU times spiked. That's the, the green, the green graph. So we got the spiked CPU time, and because this service is kind of self-healing, self-monitoring itself, when it sees that the CPU spikes, it intentionally starts to drop uh, some incoming connections to be able to handle the connections it already works on successfully. And that's the blue graph. It's the number of, of dropped connections, and you see they also spike. So what was, the, what was the issue here? The problem was that on this service runs two, two JVMs. And because <clears throat> one JVM was now doing this parallel GC and this parallel reference processing in parallel, it used much more CPU than before. It was quicker, but during this short time where it did this parallel reference processing, the CPU spiked and the service proactively started to drop connections. So this, the, again, the, the solution is quite simple just uh, restrict the number of parallel GC threads with XX parallel GC threads to a number which is lower than the number of, avail of available CPUs because by default all the CPUs will be used. And uh, after the fix was applied at the very uh, right of the graph, you see the drop connections go down again. So again, even optimizations can lead to uh, undesired behavior. So monitor your applications, do gradual uh, uh, rollout, and then such issues can easily be, easily be fixed. <clears throat> so what's the ugly part? Again, not really ugly, but uh, there are still bugs in Java. Even in older, really older versions like 17 or 8. And uh, <clears throat> I was just uh, give you examples of two things we fixed. So there was a a problem here with uh, async monitor deflation. Uh, so monitors were deflated at, at, at save point uh, before uh, Java 12 and 15, and this increased the save point time and the GC time. So actually, again, as an optimization, monitor deflation was moved out of the save points, but there was an error, a regression was introduced, and this lead could lead uh, to the fact that millions of uh, monitors could queue up and use significant amount of memory gigabytes. But this only happened in, in specific situations. And again, we found this issue, fixed it upstream. The interesting thing is that these issues were introduced in Java 12, 15. And we found it in 17, uh, 
like years after 17 became productive, right? So that's one of the unfortunate things that although the feature releases are great and we encourage everybody to use them for testing their applications, for it's still the reality is that they are not used that heavily in production. And that's why we still, it still needs time years after the long-term LTS versions are used in production before we fix or find all the issues introduced in, in the feature releases. Second example is again a, a memory leak in the symbol table. So symbol table is an internal implementation detail of, of the hotspot where it stores uh, symbols of your classes, of the metaspace and intern strings, for example. And this was triggered by Groovy. Groovy uses a lot of lambdas. And again, in Java 12, there was a re-implementation of how lambda forms were implemented. <clears throat> and this triggered then an issue in the in Hotspot internal symbol table. We could found it, uh, fix it, and we basically get such reports every week, I would say. And we fix such bugs every month, a few of these upstream. Uh, and that's for the benefit not only of, of Amazon, but also of the OpenJDK community. And that's why it's important that different vendors work together in the OpenJDK product, like Red Hat, Microsoft, SAP, Azul, all these vendors have different use cases, different clients, and they all find different corner cases and, and maintain these releases in OpenJDK. So let's come to Java 21. Quick questions. What do you think how many bugs were fixed in 2101, which is the first update release of 21, which came out one month after 21 was released? So some guess? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. That's really bad, not bad. So it was like in 2101, it was 270 issues which were fixed. From these 270 issues, we categorized 23 as really severe. We see, by severe, we mean that it's not like crashes, it's mostly data corruption. Like data corruption is really the worst you can have. Like with a crash, it's unfortunate, but you see it, you can react upon. Like with data corruption, you might only see it years later, right? Or you might get incorrect results, again, which you don't immediately see. So 104 were still serious, but, uh, and then the other ones, important. So for, two, for 2101, there is like 297 uh, fixes, which went into that update release. And two days ago, when I prepared the slides, there were already 220 slated for 2103. And I wanted to uh, show you uh, the, the JBS, the Java bug system, which I think has a lot of very nice information. So as you can see, there is already 225 until now. So in the last two days, there were five more fixes added to the 03 release. And here you can get for every, for every release, you can get uh, all, the, all the issues that were fixed. You can get the, secure, the, the, the priority. So it's 222 bucks, but let's see how many P1 and P2, like the more serious ones. So it's like just 20 of these, right? So that's a very nice tool. You can get nice, report, nice reports out of JBS. And I would encourage you to to use that also for the update releases to, to, uh, to see what's going on there. To go back to my slides. So now let's come to more practical things. What, what has to be done uh, for a successful upgrade? Well, First and foremost, you have to usually have to upgrade your dependencies. Especially the testing and mocking frameworks in our experience causes most of, most of the grief. So Mokito has to be updated, Lombok, guys, all, all this kind of stuff. The good thing is that almost all the community supported libraries, meanwhile, have supported versions for 17. And going onwards, I think this situation will improve. Like the, the real big step was from 8 to 11, 8 to 17. The future upgrades, like from 17 to 21 and 21, 25, in our experience, they will get uh, smoother and smoother. Uh, 
Then, obviously, strong encapsulation, what I showed you the example before. So either you have to fix your code to not uh, use reflective accesses anymore, or the more short-term solution is to add exports to your command line. Uh, it's unfortunate, but we see that a lot of command lines get really long <laughs> with exports for basically all the packages from all the modules. So that's a short-term solution, but in the long term, you really should rather try to upgrade to, to dependencies which don't need these reflective accesses or fix your internal code. And then also remove the add exports or from your command line to, to not maintain that. Because then, again, in a few years, that will become a maintenance nightmare. Then, actually, a good thing is that GC behavior got a lot better, and it's constantly improving. But still, it might be slightly different. As I showed you with the parallel GC, even improvements might, might result in, uh, in problems on, on the application side. So you have to monitor what's happening and maybe slightly adjust your settings CMS is gone, so, but I, I wouldn't cry for, for that <laughs> because like, I, I remember like almost 10 years ago when Java 9 came out, there were a lot of discussions. I remember at Java 1, we sit together with the community, Google complained that they see like 10, 50% CPU overhead for G1 compared to CMS and they really wanted to keep CMS. I think these days are really gone. G1 improved so nicely. We haven't, I don't know of a single internal customer who used CMS and was reluctant to move to 17 and to G1, who is not happy that he did this, uh, this move and who didn't really get improvements out of it. So, and there is not only G1, it's also new collectors like Shenandoah and ZGC, which have even lower latency and even, even better characteristics. So just try it out. Maybe you, you, you can get rid of all your uh, configuration CMS and command line tweaking you have. Just try the, the default settings of G1 or Shenandoah ZGC. For a huge amount of customers, that's already better than what they had before. And if not, you still have the possibility to fine tune it. So obviously, the bigger you are, the more you have, the more, let's say, a lot of stuff, the more you have, the more complicated uh, uh, migration gets. So, for example, for us, we have so many different developers, so many different services, dependencies, open source, inner source. Uh, we, most huge organizations have like custom build systems, deploy systems, test systems, which makes it harder to, to migrate. Internally, we have, for example, huge problems to increase the bytecode level of, of, the, li of the libraries we build. Like even in increasing that to eight makes problems to a lot of services because we have some base libraries which are used a lot, maybe not only for, for Java services uh, on, on servers, but maybe they are also used in some Android devices or Fire, Fire Stick uh, devices or stuff like that. And there they use tools which cannot handle Java 8 bytecode or Java 11 bytecode. So, there are some complications here, but uh, yeah, they, they can be solved. <clears throat> and how to get future proof? So some of these tips might actually be controversial, but it's at least our recommendation. What we see can be useful. Try to use less dependencies. While you're doing these upgrades, take the chance to remove unused dependencies. Go to newer versions of the libraries. Go to different libraries, if that's possible, which use less internal uh, stuff like unsafe or reflection. Uh, avoid mocks, if possible. It's nice feature. Some people like it. But we see it as a major blocker for, for upgrades. Uh, and also, keep your, as I said, keep your dependencies up to date, not only to make it easier in the future to upgrade, but also to take advantage of the... Of the of the benefits you, you, you get from upgrades to get uh, to, to benefit from the improvements which have been made in these libraries. So one is the security, but the other is the performance improvements you get for free, not only from the JVM upgrade, but also be from a base library you are using, which brings you maybe even more benefits than the, a new GC version or a new JVM version. 
then uh, tests, yeah, do more unit tests, do integration tests. Some people say unit tests are enough, they cover everything. In our experience, that's not enough. Really do the integration tests, test all critical edge cases, uh, test the extreme cases, as I showed you before, uh, do load tests, and fix flaky tests. So a lot, uh, a lot of times, like the, I would say 80% of the migration effort is in tests, not in the application itself. Because tests usually use even all the dependencies, all the libraries, and fixing them is, is harder. But when, once you're on the tests anyway, fix, also take the chance to fix flaky tests, make them more stable, add additional testing. Uh, and look at your metrics. If you don't have them, add more metrics. It's always useful. You should monitor like latency, memory, CPU consumption. Uh, and uh, look at the logs. As I said, it doesn't make sense to collect the logs. Most services we know do logging and they save them, but it doesn't make sense if you never look at them. So don't leave broken windows behind. And uh, as I said, use the opportunity to modernize your application. If you have to do slight code changes anyway to upgrade your code base, take the chance and modernize the whole application once you're at it. And everything you do while upgrading from 8 to 17 will then benefit you and go to 21 or later releases and make that even smoother. So in the last part of my talk, I want to speak a little bit about tools which can help you to, uh, to do this upgrade. So there is a lot of tooling available and I expect we, see, we will see even more in the future, uh, especially uh, like uh, LLM based and uh, generative AI based tools. Until now, we have this as programmer aid for to doing quicker development, but I think they just start, these technologies that start being used for upgrading for migrations. Uh, so there is a lot of open source tools available. There's open rewrite. There is the Eclipse migration toolkit for Java. They can basically migrate from one Java version to another. Open rewrite is also available for other languages like Python or I don't know. Uh, other libraries, yes. Then wind up migration toolkit for, for runtimes. I think that that's from Red Hat and IBM. Uh, Eclipse Migration Toolkit for Java can also be used to upgrade, uh, f to, um, to support um, uh, migrating from one application server to another, for example. And uh, Amazon itself announced uh, Amazon Q Code Transformation. It's a preview feature uh, for Code Whisper. It's only available if you have a commercial Code Whisper license until now. And as I say, it's a preview feature, but that's basically based on open rewrite. And it adds uh, LLM and generative AI functionality to, to an open rewrite-based approach to make it even, even more applicable. So Amazon, I mean, all these tools work in, 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 a, in a similar way. It's just, just uh, an example of how Amazon Q Code transformation works. It basically starts to analyze your, your code locally, uh, and then it sends your, your local build uh, and tool which, after verifying that everything works locally, it sends it to the, to the system in the cloud, and then it analyzes, updates, tests, compiles in a loop several times until it gets to uh, a state where it thinks that it's, it's ready for, up, for upgrade, and then it sends you a big patch back, and then you as a developer have the chance to review this patch and then integrate it and do more testing. So in more detail, like these tools, First, usually build and test with Java 8, again, to verify that everything works. And then they apply rules uh, from, from a knowledge base. So Open Rewrite, for example, has a public knowledge base of uh, transformations which can be done to move from 8 to 11 and from 11 to 17, like recipes. It's the same for the Eclipse Toolkit. And they do this, and after they apply it, uh, these uh, transformations, they build and test with, with uh, Java 17, and then if they get build errors, these build errors can trigger 
like the application of, of other rules which are in the database, and then you go in this circle. So as an example of uh, this rule-based approaches, like which is applied statically before even building, there is rules that know that if you move to Java 17, you have to upgrade Jackson, for example, so it just does this upgrades in your, in your local POM file before even building with 17, and that should already help. Uh, for the second example, which I told you is like, then you start building, and then you might get some build errors, and these tools parse the build errors, and then they see that some package is missing, and they have a rule which says if this package is missing, then you should add another dependency to the POM file, so they do that, and then they build again, and that all goes in a circle. So especially this last part, uh, to fix error, <coughs> that's, that's the part where LLMs and Generative AI can help. And that is also how Amazon Q works. So for example, this is a more sophisticated issue that, which was not in the database before. <coughs> it, uh, just, uh, the comp compiler just complains that we are catching an exception which is not actually thrown. Because like the implementation of this function has been changed and it doesn't throw an exception anymore. So the uh, LLM recognized this and it, it generates your new code which simply removes the try-catch clause. And it, this is not the end actually. The, if, if the recompilation might not trigger another error because maybe this function hasn't completely removed the exception, maybe it changed the exception to another type. So it will run into a new compile error saying that you don't catch this exception and then a new try-catch block might be added. And this is how this works. So I must say, uh, we started internally, I think like six months ago, to use open rewrite. And the first, the first results were really disappointing. <laughs> like we, we did, a, 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 we tried, we started with 100 projects and out of these 100 projects or services, no, no single service could be auto, completely automatically migrated. So a lot of, I mean, the open, open rewrite approach helped uh, to uh, eliminate a lot of manual work, but like the expectation was that at least some can be automatically migrated and no single one succeeded. But then we started like uh, augmenting, like adding more rules to this database. A lot of times, as I said, we have some, 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 some details, some peculiarities which are only in our code base which like an open source code base cannot cover. So you start adding new rules which you find which are significant for, for your own code base and then the rules uh, improve and, uh, and the transformations get better and better and after a few iterations we managed to migrate like 40, 50 out of 100 services automatically. And then just recently we started to experiment with, uh, with Amazon Q which again started to improve uh, the, the, the results. But again, it, it needs a lot of time to train these systems. And the more you train them, the, the better are the results. So depending on your use case and the size of the code you want to migrate, it might make sense to use such tools. Obviously, the bigger your organization, the bigger your code, case, uh, uh, your code base, the more it makes sense to use, this, to use such tools or to invest in improving these tools, either the open source versions or to invest in uh, buying such tools. Because again, if you uh, run them at, at a, on a big scale, it might still be a benefit. So I think that's all I wanted to tell you. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. There's one behind there, please. Yes. Yes, they use a lot of reflection and not only of your code, but of the, they often mock like base objects, like string or even object and uh, that doesn't gonna work and, and got more and more complicated with newer versions of Java. Yeah, sorry, the question was why to avoid mocks. Yeah, I should uh, have remembered to repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. Um, if you're telling us to
Yes, obviously. Yes. So the question is, what is the sweet spot? When to upgrade? If if you upgrade too early, we might run. We might be the first who see these issues. <laughs> so it's it's a chicken egg problem. Obviously, if if like if say everybody waits, if I now tell you that like the third up update release, that's the sweet spot, and everybody in the community would listen to me and just upgrade to 21 or three, then obviously we get no benefit because nobody would find the <laughs> issues in. Before, so, but like in general, as I said, you you have to do some internal testing. You, if you are a bigger organization, if you have several services, you have to monitor. As I say, we we encourage people also use the feature releases, just not productively because we cannot support them. We cannot support so many different. We already support eight, eleven, seventeen. 21. We just have no. We we actually tried to do something like this midterm support releases. I think Azul tried that in OpenJDK to support like every second feature release for longer. I don't think it really worked out. It's it's too much work. But still, like we encourage the developers to locally test their code with these feature releases. That already gives them a, a good sense, a good feeling of of what change of of what they have to do, and then like. For the productive usage, we definitely only recommend, recommend LTS releases. And uh, like as I said, we internally might recommend uh, April 21 or 3 release for general productive usage or maybe the, the summer one. So th that's our work. So after like two, three up update releases, probably should be fine. Yes, please. A, a, a what? Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. I'm from the JVM team. <laughs> but we have other colleagues here from, from Amazon. Uh, I think two of them are sitting behind there, so you might get in contact. And the a question was if there will be a Swedish availability zone, which is beyond my pay grade. So <laughs> yes, other questions? Yes, one more. I uh, know, just go, you were first. No, I mean, we, we, we only use Coretto internally. But Coretto, Coretto is, is, has no extra features. It's intentionally, like Coretto is, has no differentiating features. We are constantly discussing this. A lot of customers want us to put more features into Coretto, whereas other customers are afraid to get customer login, uh, uh, vendor login, if we put features in Coretto. So currently Coretto is really 100% open JDK. The only thing where Coretto sometimes differs is if we manage to put a fix in upstream into the update release, but it didn't made it to the cut for, let's say, 1711. We know like the, the, the up, 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 update releases has two repositories. The one is called for, for 17, 17U dev, which is the development version of the update train, and then 17U. And every six months, Every three months, there is a branch from 17U dev to 17U, where, where the update, the, the following update release is, is, is stabilized. And if you don't make this cut, your fix won't be in the next uh, update release. Sometimes, if we manage to put that into the dev release of, of the update release, but don't make the cut, we might put it uh, one release earlier into Coretto. But apart from that, we don't have any other features. And all these uh, numbers you will get no matter which OpenJDK release you will use. The one from Eclipse or Azul or Microsoft or SAP, you always should see the same results. So I think you had a, one more question.
Okay, cool. Good to hear. Yes, you have one more question. He just mentioned that he has some secret information that there will be a Swedish <laughs> availability soon. soon. I don't comment on that. Well, I don't know. I mean, the question was why we are settling in Shenandoah and why not using ZGC. Shenandoah, as I, as I told you, it was started by Red Hat as an open, J, open JDK project and they put a lot of effort into it. ZGC was developed by Oracle internally. Nobody knew that they are developing it and they came out with it after Shenandoah was already basically production ready. So it's just... I would say it's good. The more choices you have, the better. And actually, they push it each other to, to, the, to the boundaries. So like when uh, we announced that we develop Generation Shenandoah, CGC came out with the generational feature as well. I mean, I don't want to pretend that we push them to develop Generation CGC, but maybe if we haven't done it, maybe they had done it like a few years later or haven't prior hadn't prioritized it. So. As always, as with the JIT compilers, as with the different JDKs, in the past it was great that IBM did J9 because without J9, Hotspot probably wouldn't have improved that much. And it's the same now with Graal, JIT, and things like that. That really like a little bit of uh, choice is, is always great, and especially for, for the customer. So I think it's good that we have this. And actually we are not forcing our customers, internal, you know, internal ones to use Shenandoah GC, we actually uh, ask everybody to test and if G ZGC should become better than Shenandoah, I mean, it's an open JDK project, it's, it's free for everybody. We are happy to recommend everybody to use ZGC. We, we, we don't have any. As long as the results are fine, we are fine with these technologies. Yes. Okay, cool. So official statement <laughs> that there exists a availability zone in Stockholm. Okay, maybe that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Have a nice last day at J Focus.